Han Chi, hello. I'm Josh Nelson from Eastside Games, and we're super excited to support Imaginative's Digital Development Day this year. I'm Métis and from Willow River in Northern BC, but I currently reside in Vancouver, which is on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, Squamish, Stolo, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations. Games tell unique and passionate stories, and I can't wait to see what you're building and how to bring that to the world. My team and I look forward to seeing what you create and sharing with you. Marcy, have a great festival. I went to an audition. The casting director looked at me and she was just like, oh, you cut your hair. I used to call you Pocahontas. I froze. That in itself is a slur. And the real story of Pocahontas is one of uh, rape and like molestation of children. So it's not a compliment. Seek more from our stories because there's so much more in the 500 plus indigenous cultures across this country that we haven't seen in film and TV before. I like sort of like the words that are being used, sort of like uh, the digital world and sort of like creating something that will like come to life. So because we're able to create these entire worlds um, or sort of like uh, change like our current reality, um, there's a bit of a gap um, between what we can see and uh, who can see it. Since viewers need a bit of training um, to use and experience this safely, um, can you speak to sort of interest in, uh, instances um, where you can like introduce someone to VR for the first time and sort of like, what was their what was their experience of this like sort of fabricated world? UC has been really fortunate to get like a hundred. Oculus Go headsets, and we have classroom size um, training tools that we can go in and put people in headsets. And um, one of our experiences, Writing on Stone, um, it's a kind of a spiritual tour of a really sacred location in Alberta, Canada. And um, we have Eugene Brave Rock, who plays in Wonder Woman. He's the narrator, and his voice is like amazing. But the whole point of it is to just show how meaningful and spiritual that um, that place is to Indigenous people. And um, if you were to tell people or to show pictures or to have maybe even a film, I don't think it would have the same impact. Like 30% of people that, that experience that cried at the end of it um, because they're so moved by being in that space and being part of it and the journey that they're on, that a lot of people are like having a strong emotional reaction to it. And I don't think that you would be able to achieve that without using virtual reality. I just don't think that any other medium would be as effective. And so for that reason, like kind of Casey said, there are some stories that need to be told in a certain place and in a certain format. And I think that in certain cases, virtual reality is perfect for opening up those um, empathy pathways in your brain and building skills in unique ways that we've never built them before. And, um, and it creates connection that you could not do in other ways. And for that reason, like, I think VR really is uh, a, a magical gateway to all these like digital worlds and even, even worlds that exist that people can't, um, that are prohibited you know, that they can't access um, maybe because of accessibility or cost or whatever. Um, so I think it's such a powerful, powerful machine to getting people to understanding our shared collective history. So the biggest takeaway I had from that is like other people experiencing VR for the first time. And I remember my first time in VR, like it, it blew my mind for like a good four hours straight. Um, so I really enjoy showing other people VR for the first time because the reaction is almost always the same. They're just like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and that keeps on happening in different ways, the, the different things that they experience. And I find that that sense of, of wonder or excitement, like, that's something that naturally kind of like um, diminishes a bit over time. You know, you 
grow older, you become an adult, you experience a lot of different things. And that's that innate sense of like wonder and excitement that you had when you were a kid kind of like fizzles out a little bit. So I think that that VR is a way that that kind of like brings that back in a way you kind of like rekindle with a different part of yourself and um, you're able to to feel things and understand things a bit differently. Um, and it's really exciting. So for me, what that does for me is like makes me want to push more of like the experimental nature, um, maybe in different ways to to kind of like further promote that that sense of like, you know, wonder, excitement, um, creating things from from almost nothing, really. Like I feel there's like a heavy sense of alchemy um, whenever, you know, creating in a VR or 3D space because you're you're able to really tap into these um different parts of your imagination um where you can make these these really weird things into a really you know beautiful reality and it really hit me that you guys did it really well <laughs> but um yeah i think it's like a whole body experience which is cool right you can like reach out and touch things and you can hear the hearing like sound is so important to like react with what you're doing and um yeah just like that sense of memory rather than it being like I watched a, a movie you know I think being in VR like you are the character and it just has that that next step into immersive like agency you know um but yeah thanks um so with um I guess virtual reality and having it be so um community oriented or you need to have like um this equipment to sort of alter um the physical space um how do you feel the pandemic has changed uh the digital media presence do you think it's like um become more popular or sort of what do you guys think I think it's definitely become more popular you know with the reliance on uh digital communication in general um it's really pushed a lot of of the interest for uh, virtual reality devices for a lot more AR um, sort of implementation within you know education, learning, or or entertainment. Um, and then within the pandemic, it became like a, a lot of the public was having that like dissociation sort of sort of situation like i'm mostly introverted like not being around people has been fine for me right but there ha there have been points where it's just like you know i could really you know it would be nice to interact with someone in person or the first time you you had a conversation with someone face to face after like two months of isolation was a weird time right um and one thing that happened for me was that i was involved in the pxr uh, uh festival and I did a, my first artist talk within a virtual reality environment. So it was, it was within alt space. There was like a slideshow of my work that I could like cycle through and that sort of thing. Um, so it was really interesting to, to do that, right? Whereas if the pandemic wasn't a thing, I would be in Kingston or wherever it was taking place to actually do an in-person talk. So this, this kind of like pushed our, our adaptability uh, um, to be able to still gather in some sort of capacity. Um, but it kind of like replaced that in-person thing, right? It, like we're replaced with, with avatars, um, but still able to come together. And, and in even some cases, like um, be able to communicate even better, right? Like within the pandemic, a lot of the things that would have been very um, not necessarily to say secluded, just like for lack of a better term, but like private, like for instance, uh, an artist talk that was, that would normally happen within this gallery, um, and only accessible by people who could attend in person. This has now become a zoom link that's available all over the world. Right. Um, so arguably it's, it's, um, done some really good things for artists and, and accessibility in general. Um, I think in terms of accessibility, that's like virtual reality is, is becoming more accessible. It used to be, you know, kind of like this, I hate to use the word, but like elitist 
sort of thing where you had to have like a two thousand dollar laptop with you know a thousand dollar twelve hundred dollar you know vr headset is now becoming you know a standalone thing with quest twos or or other developers and even more um organizations are developing these um these you know pieces of software and hardware to make it even more accessible right um and ar is another very powerful tool because everyone has a high powered computer right in their hand with their phone right now so ar is becoming more and more um uh, usable in terms of of you know, communication and learning and entertainment all over the world i think that um vr is is getting to be way, way more accessible and way easier to bring to the masses. And I think that it provides so many more opportunities for people to increase their digital literacy as well. Like Casey sort of talked about digital literacy as being sort of not as strong in our communities. And I would say that that's true. But through the use of like VR headsets, you can have people sculpt in 3D, um, you can have people do different um, do different things in, in 3D and in VR that you can actually transform into AR, which is one of the projects that we did. But the pandemic has caused challenges in that no one wants to put on a headset after somebody else has worn a headset. So we've had to have like this clean box technology that uses like UVC light to sterilize the headsets. So we have to like package them and deliver them to schools. And then they could do like virtual field trips because they weren't able to do real field trips, which was kind of a cool way that they were using our headsets to kind of give youth a bit of a, like a break from their classrooms, which I thought was really neat. Um, then we also were able to like use VR during the pandemic to um, like, uh, youth were kind of ashamed of like video chats because their homes weren't necessarily pristine. So, or they had lots of family around or things like that. So we were actually able to get youth to use VR headsets that we gave them to have at their homes and they could get in VR and we could like go into alt space or rec room or different like open um, VR games like that. And we could like play basketball together or have campfire talks. Um, we actually similar like hosted panel discussions in alt space where we got to use our avatars and we were in VR headsets, which is a really unique experience. Um, and I have found in most cases, like we can connect with people like Kat, which we wouldn't normally be able to do given conventional sort of film festivals and art gallery spaces and all of those things. And I have seen both the pros and the cons of this technology in the pandemic, like the resistance to get into a headset, of course, but then also sort of like this increasing uh, just need almost to get into these like really cool virtual spaces because everyone's at home. And I think that there's, I think it's been both good and bad is I guess what I'm saying. Um, but, you know, when you look at like GPS apps and things like that with augmented reality, people can go for walks and interact with art. And as the art galleries are closed for groups, um, there's like an opportunity to like, drop some like cool indigenous art in like city halls around the world potentially, um, which I think is amazing. Um, so I think, yeah, there's like a ferocious appetite for more technology, but also like a fear of putting on headsets. Yeah, um, both really awesome points. The only thing I would uh, add is you also touched on the alt space stuff. I feel like the XR community is really in the right position to take advantage of the metaverse like you know, conversations that are going on at the moment and we're all world builders already. We're making environments. Our heads kind of fit in that multimedia space. Um, and I think the, you know, COVID um, situation has just meant that everyone has kind of leaned more into understanding what that looks like. And, you know, NFTs are huge now. And um, just thinking about like all that, the newer technology again, like how the XR community is actually like quite, well placed to to take advantage of of that um but yeah that's the only other thing i did i agree with all of you where uh to the point where um we now use technology in a different way um where technology is sort of adapted and how we can use it in every day um speak like is there a way where um like you've adapted or learned um from your work 
to um, that goes across any of other disciplines. Yeah, I'll talk to that. Um, I I just finished my my Master of Fine Arts um, degree in the spring, and in leading up to that, um, I was creating this this big um, multimedia like interactive installation, and it was about two months before it was to go up and that sort of thing. I created um, like a 3D mock-up of, of the installation within the space. And like, cause I had the vision of it in my, in my head, right. How I wanted to look and stuff. And then when I created this, this model in a space, and then I was able to, you know, look at it in a headset, I was able to get a really, really tangible um idea as to how it would feel and react and then just things within like how how things looked within the space um i started to take other things into consideration just by having that additional visual stimulus and information to go off of so that digital sort of work really influenced the the actual physical work and i felt that i was able to prepare myself um, a lot more for those potential variables. Um, also, it was able to give me an idea as to like how light would would bounce and sound would reflect around the space. Um, so I, it was it was a very very beneficial um, approach and tool. Um, so it was a, a direct uh, influence of my of my other you know physical installation work for sure. I do not have a good example like that. Um, I was just going to say that, you know, I um, I write reports for a living. I write reports and funding applications and I talk to donors and funders. And, um, and for me, I've realized like how important it is to be engaging um, and to kind of just be like more fun. And, you know, I'm a technical writer. I write really technical things. And, uh, you know, I write research papers and things like that. And so, um, you know, I I think that I've been influenced by our, you know, our leap into media by being like, oh, you know, like I can connect additional things through QR codes, or maybe I can explain this in a more oral way. I could maybe include parts where it's me talking about this or like an oral report and sort of pushing back on sort of that conventional written thing that funders and donors often want to do, or, you know, even people that want to fund our installations or media. And so um, I've been influenced on like, no one wants to read something really boring. And so um, even though like I enjoy it kind of, but you know, no one like it, to make it more fun and engaging is important. And you're gonna get more people interested in talking about the important indigenous issues facing our community if you get them engaged in a personal and emotional way. And so I've learned a lot about seeing people experience those VR and AR um, you know, activities that we've done. And I've transformed that into the way I write and the work that I do um, you know, like the work that I'm doing on my end to actually get those programs funded and, you know, successfully launched in our, in our organization. So I think that's been a huge learning for me is like, just make things interactive and fun and it'll be much more successful. And I mean, we've seen that, like the more I've done that, the more successful and the more growth we've had. So I think that's a really important takeaway for me is just be more fun. I'm not really a fun person, but you know, like that's, I think a strong thing to do. Um, my experience is uh, similar to Casey's where we were designing a kind of like a museum and a truck that would travel around New Zealand and teach um, communities about the uh, Māori history of New Zealand and um, we put it in a virtual environment but it, you know all you know museum writing it's pretty intense so like digitally put it in a truck and then we had AR interactive elements and virtual reality elements and physical interactive stuff so we had to make sure that the flow was right, the augmented reality was great, the font size was right. And so putting it in a VR space gave us, and we were working with the Ministry of Education for this one. Um, and so it was really important for the client to be able to be in that space and feel comfortable as well. So, um, yeah, that's like a, an example. And then virtual production, which 
um, we, um, I also do like traditional video, um, you know, filmy work as well. And having um, the use of virtual production now where you can actually have a, you know, a, a screen, like a LED screen, but you've got like a fully 3D environment there with real actors and you like light it and do it and it changes and interacts with you is like such an awesome um, tool to use. And so um, you can really bring people into like a sci-fi space now and um, but with real people. So uh, yeah, that's, that's been a really fun um, development for us to be playing with. Um, with uh, VR and AR being very um, community-based, um, like and very intimidating for someone who um, is new to it. Um, what would you recommend? Like, how would you how would you recommend getting into the practice for someone who's watching at home? I think just get over the imposter syndrome. Like, I always just feel like totally like, why am I doing this? This is like the weirdest thing. Like, why am I here? Like, I don't belong here. Why am I even talking at imaginative and like all of this stuff about XR? Like, this is not, why am I here? And like, I think the majority of it, like it, that imposter syndrome is like half of the challenge, like just getting over it and just doing it. And then the XR world is super open. Like you can YouTube anything. You can like learn pretty much anything on YouTube. It's amazing. And it's going to be hard and it's going to feel new and it's going to be a big learning curve. But Everybody feels like that. Like this is brand new technology. It's okay to feel like you don't belong in this space. And so I know that as like indigenous people, there's probably an, an additional layer of that imposter syndrome there. But, um, and then I guess as women too, there's probably even more um, of not belonging in, in these sort of techie spaces. But um, I think when you're just like, you know what, I'm here, I'm doing it. I'm going to like bust through the door. I'm going to sit in these spaces, even though I don't feel like I belong. Uh, that's probably like 50% of it. And then just YouTube the crap out of it and just enjoy it and just go for it. Um, and there are so many people that are just willing to help you because they just love the medium. So just reaching out, I think is amazing. And there's lots of cool resources um, like I am for lab and different places like that that work with Indigenous people in Canada. So I think there's tons of opportunities just to connect and, and do it, but just get over it. It's okay to like feel like a weird imposter. I'm going to uh, piggyback on a lot of those points. Um, yeah, like if you have even just a mild interest in, in any of these technologies, just give it a try. You know, you're never going to know what you're good at or if you're good at something unless unless you try it, right? Like um, Western Art Moving Pictures were the ones that introduced uh, VR to me. I started playing super hot and then they suggested that I get into Tilt Brush. Um, so I started creating, you know, Northern animals based on like legends and that sort of thing. And then three to four months after that, I felt like I was still just beginning. Um, I am four reached out to me to bring me down to Vancouver to teach workshops in Tilt Brush, you know, and then fast forward like another year or two and I'm working with Leanne and, you know, it's, it's, there's so much opportunity in this field um, for indigenous people. So like, and there's also a need, you know, like I'm, I'm always asked from people who are creating these projects, like, do you know any indigenous art directors or indigenous like 3D modelers or animators or stuff? And it's like, I can't come up with the list of people off the top of my head. So that just goes to show that um, there is a lot of room and space within, within this field. Um, and it pays well, you know, um, and as well, like the community, like, let's be honest, man, we're all a bunch of nerds. We're all like figuring this stuff out ourselves. Um, and for people, and it's, it's not really bound by like, you know, culture or even like region, right? Like one of my favorite, um, VR artists, his name is giant swan, um, from Australia, I've been following his stuff for a long time and eventually I just reached out to him and we just started talking, you know, started talking about tilt brush and other sorts of like hardware and software. And yeah, as, as Leanne said, you'd be surprised as to how many people are just willing to help, you know, it's uh, it's a, a environment that I feel very comfortable and, and supported in. 
um, and that feels really good. So if you have any sort of interest at all, um, definitely just, you know, yeah, look it up on the internet. If you can afford a headset or anything like that, they're getting, you know, a lot cheaper now. Um, so definitely just, just get into it. You know, it'll be worth it for sure. Yeah. There's no rules, so you can't go wrong. <laughs> and um, I think the other thing I'd add is the, um, it's, you know, when you go like to a careers person to help you figure out what's, you know, what is a career path, like in VR, there's like, they wouldn't even suggest that. And so, but within VR or XR, there's just like so many different um, like, and just, you know, types of jobs within it. You can do 3D modeling or writing for virtual reality. Um, like this, I can't even list them up, but there's so many different ones. So you kind of have to peek inside to kind of see what the 100 different types of jobs are that there that you could be interested in um, because it's not kind of like one role for everything. So yeah, we need everyone and definitely we need more Indigenous people in the space because it um, is kind of growing, you know. Thanks. Uh, so like, I guess I want to talk to you guys about um, sort of um, when you guys are learning a new skill or sort of, uh, a workflow, uh, what approaches do you make and what, what's the best approach for you about something new? YouTube, 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 forums. Um, yeah um that's like that's it's kind of the way of learning now and and has been for a long time like you know i spend a lot of time with within just like researching blender tutorials or you know gravity sketch or tilt brush or adobe medium um chances are if you have a question someone out there has an answer for it in some sort of capacity i've run into a few things that i've had to like dig deep deep into forums from something that someone posted in like 2017 for some sort of resolve. Um, but that's usually how a lot of people um, learn to do things nowadays. Um, a lot of uh, resources are found within like the, the help um, menus within the software themselves. Um, for instance, uh, Gravity Sketch, which is like a virtual reality modeling uh, program, they have a, a very thorough um, user manual and tutorial guide right in headset. So you can learn all of these things right there. You can have the video up while you're trying everything out um, within the headset. So it's, it's a, a really, really good resource. I would just say um, also try heaps of content. Just like try what's been done, what was the stuff earlier on and um, what's happening now and um, kind of almost write notes down about what you loved about the experience and what you think, you know, you would improve on and kind of just like getting more familiar with what people are doing and maybe what are the challenges, why didn't it work so well. And, um, yeah, I think that's that's key. And then when you go and do make the work yourself, again, just like experiment and try new things and, um, it's better to like try and know, oh, that didn't work, then not try at all. So yeah, being able to compare and learn from others is, is like super important. And I think too, like, um, don't forget that there's like lots of different roles in XR. You know, not everyone's an artist or coding or, um, you know, an art director. There's like all of these different roles. You could do sound composition, FX. Um, there's... You know, like we've hired people where they've um, created a score for our our experiences. Um, we've hired musicians to do lots of different things. There's voiceover actors. We've done even 3D scans where we use like Mixamo to create 3D animations. Um, we've had artists just do pencil renderings that we've created into 3D models. So it's like, there's so many different roles and like, even me, I'm not an artist, but I'm still part of the creative um, concepts of what happens. So um, it's not just about like the conventional roles that people think there's so many different roles in XR that it's worth exploring your particular way of expressing yourself in that. And um, it's not just what you think it is. There's so many different components to it. So I would encourage people like, to become part of teams if they can, or or reach out and talk to people because um, there's lots of different opportunities. You don't have to be good at coding, is what I'm saying. Like there are other places for you to exist in the XR space. Of course, that's that's good to know. Um, 
So we have talked about this um, uh, sort of a bit. Um, so with VR and AR uh, having a large presence and different things in terms of like um, entertainment or sort of educational tools, um, what do you see as like a potential um, indigenous sort of media app or sort of platform that can be used? I'm not even sure what you mean. Do you have like an example? Like, do you mean like Oculus or? Right, I, I'll, I'll chime in just because okay. I wrote these. Um, uh, I had written like specific indigenous applications of this technology, but um, not not like as in an app or a platform, like a way to use this technology that is like strictly and fully indigenous. Wow. I mean, it's, it's so open in that regard. Um, you know, like I, I, I think that language learning language is, is a really big one. That's not necessarily something that I do, but you know, people like Leanne and, and other developers, they use that to teach language. Um, one thing, a project that I'm um, working on right now um, as a collaborative project with a, a developer in the UK is all about reforestation. So it has this like environmentalism uh, kind of act around it, uh, which speaks to land, you know, paying respect to the land and it'll respect you and that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, from my perspective, like the, the, the celebration of like our stories and, and our culture and, and our legends and that sort of thing. That's something that's um, you're able to give it a lot of presence within a virtual reality space, right? Like this thing is this big, you know, as opposed to like showing it on the screen and you have to kind of like do the math in your head yourself, right? You can put someone right in the middle of your idea as opposed to it being on this plane or this surface. They could be completely surrounded by it. And that's one of the things I think is most fascinating about it. Um, I think another thing for me would be um, having pro like tech, it's a model of tikanga, but protocols, so indigenous protocols around how you would enter the space and um, be welcomed into it, and then uh, yeah, and then having the experience, and then and then leaving the space again. So making sure that um, it's a controlled environment, so you can kind of like do the best you can um, in that like the protocol space, um, which I think is something that. Um, a lot of the time with, you know, time is poor and, you know, some of these uh, practices can take a long time. So, um, yeah, in your virtual space, you have full control of time and space. So um, you can kind of utilise that to an Indigenous advantage. Yeah. I don't really have much to add. I think um, Indigenous applications, definitely language learning, skill building, um, I think training in terms of like, exposure to jobs and um, <clears throat> things like that are really important. Um, and definitely indigenous protocol. And I think you can um, have indigenous protocol uh, be part of the way you actually create the content too, like the actual behind the scenes of creating the content, not just the content itself. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that those applications are really, really the main ones for us. Um, one of the things I think is really important though, is like, um, you know, exploring as research starts to emerge from, you know, even like non-Indigenous places, like, uh, you know, you see this research coming out about how VR can be as effective as painkillers for cancer patients and things like that. So I think it's really important as like research like that comes out that we think about that through the lens of what it means for the Indigenous community, potentially around like, you know, stress and trauma and uh, healing and well-being and access and all of those different things, I think we could start to develop really interesting conversations about what that might look like for our communities. Can I also just add one more thing? Um, just in relation to Rangi Tufira, which is the um, VR experience showing and imaginated this year, it was um, it is about reclaiming our, the lost um, instruments, Māori instruments, and it's, it's a perfect example of like, a, a putoreno, which is a flute instrument, is, you know, there's not that many of them anymore. And the, the craft of actually carving one and creating one was lost. And so through virtual reality, we're able to collaborate with the very few experts that we have. Um, so Brian Flintoff is the, the carver who created this um, putoreno. Um, 
and bring it to like more people because you know this one instrument is a one of a kind and so you know to do a photogrammetry you know like a photo real version of it and take it to multiple people all around the world to experience this one Portorino um is such a unique experience and I think that's such a um you know so reclaiming in, in sharing the stories of things that are so sacred um but that we want to more people to experience because it's so beautiful you know um okay so I just wanted to talk about um the title of the panel um a little bit so native realities indigenous VR AR and XR we know VR is to be virtuality and AR as augmented reality. But as many people know, XR, which is shorthand, mixed reality, this term is a bit funny because it doesn't strictly exist yet. It refers to instead of fluidity between media or um, VR and AR uh, in one installation. Since the term is not well defined, I wanted to ask what your idea of your idea of indigenous mixed reality might look like. Um, well, I, with, within my practice before being involved in, in VR and XR, like as an interdisciplinary artist, my, my main mediums were like sculpture with audio, light, paint. So it's, it's the ability to bring all of these things together. Um, so my understanding of, of XR coming from that kind of vantage point is that it doesn't necessarily have to be digital mediums mixed together, you know, like um, mixed reality to me could be like, you know, virtual reality or augmented reality elements embedded within a physical installation. You know, you could walk around something and depending on the location where you're at, different things will happen within a, a digital space, whether it be by headset or by your phone um, or anything like that. Um, I I feel that there's there's so much potential within within XR um, that it's not just defined to one specific like hardware or software that it's 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 to me it's very very open ended. I kind of think of as the X from XR as experimental because it really allows a lot of different things to happen within um, within this, this world, this, this digital world that you can create or by mending, um, different realities together. Yeah. My, um, understanding of XR is just anything reality, you know, like, um, however you want to play with it and, um, interact, be interactive with it. Maybe interactive, it might be like where I'm going with that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's anything for me, um, the way to express stories. Yeah, I mean, when I think of like mixed, you know, mixed medium, and I think really of like Casey's work, he's like, you know, pretty good at like, um, to, you know, creating something in VR. And then it becomes like, if for us, when he worked with us, he created a, a piece of artwork, a sculpture in VR, uh, where he painted it, and then we utilized it with as a with an AR target image to be part of our magazine cover. I mean, for me, that that really is sort of mixing and matching different mediums in a way that's super unique. Um, and so I think that um, we're getting to a place where we can sort of like utilize one tool to enhance the other and go back and forth in a really unique way. Um, you know, I think of like our newest installation, like an outdoor art installation that could be technically put into a virtual head, virtual reality headset it also becomes like a target image and then it's also a GPS location thing. So you have all these like different ways that we can have people all over the world access it. Um, so I think we're kind of figuring out where that might be and what it might look like. Uh, right now, I like the kind of mix and match craziness of uh, XR. Um, and we really use it because we have to, right? You know, creating spaces for indigenous people to create artwork in like a really cool way when they may not have like the skills of like Blender or Maya or things like that. Uh, so working with technology, we're always looking towards the future, um, looking at like five, 10 or even like 50 years ahead uh, in our industries. Um, what changes would you like to see take place um, for a more responsible, inclusive reality? 
I think um, the work that we are all doing now in terms of um, getting creating a pipeline for our young people, you know, to have, uh, you know, be the voice of the future. I think that's probably my number one focus um, in terms of enabling a, a future where um, it's not hard to find, you know, a 3D, an Indigenous 3D modeler or, you know, an Indigenous writer that can really um, own the space. So I think that's like number one for me. Um, and then... I guess, um, I guess funding is an interesting one because Indigenous um, projects aren't always the best funded. And um, so how do we create an ecosystem where the budgets are better so that we can pay for them properly and get the right resourcing on the projects um, and, you know, create an audience that people are willing to watch and, and consume and play with and interact with it. So I think that would be like dream state. And um, and so we've got like a really viable business model. And then it's like, in terms of like geeky sci-fi stuff that I love, it's like, you know, everything is like um, your whole, you know, storytelling experience is seamless from like, you know, you walk into your house and you've been listening to a podcast and it flips on and then the movie of that might start playing because you're like, I like to listen to it, but I also want to watch it when I'm home. And how do you have a seamless like storytelling experience um, in, in different spaces and um, in different ways you want to consume the same story? I think that's really interesting. And whether the room becomes a 3D environment of your story or whether actually you just, you know, two people are in the room or one person's in the room, like can things seamlessly change depending on your situation? I think that would be super cool. I'd like to see a, a big influx in um, in acceptance of of the mediums. You know, um, accessibility would probably be just top um, of of my list. You know, um, seeing a lot of people being able to experience like VR and AR a lot easier. Um, but in terms of acceptance, I think I'm speaking more from an artistic perspective. Um, cause I feel like there's a lot of people who are still like, is virtual reality in 3d art, real art, or is it just like this thing? And, and, uh, I think NFTs were definitely something that, um, legitimized that it is an art form because people are willing to pay massive amounts of money for these digital creations. Um, but more within the fine arts sort of world in general, like let's say having an exhibit of just, you know, 3D or AR um, creations, like to me that should be looked at as, as a fine art or as a skill um, that, that is, you know, a reflection of, of your personality and, and your soul, just like any other sort of form of art, whether it be a painting or, or a film or something like that. Um, and and the digital literacy all over the world and in the north, I'd like to see that uh, a lot higher. I agree. Yeah, like um, increasing the number of indigenous digital artists, indigenous three D artists, content creators, storytellers in uh, you know the VR AR space. I think that would be what I would hope for the future. That it's just not an issue. It's just not a thing. I also agree that like, I would hope that um, Indigenous stories aren't still like fringe stories. You know, they're just stories that people access and are interested in. Um, I feel like it's not seen as like a real story or it's not legitimate or some, it sort of still seems very fringe. And certainly when you're telling stories through XR, it definitely feels like it's somehow not legitimate in some way. So I guess my, my optimistic future, um, you know, would be that like indigenous storytelling in any medium is completely part of sort of the mainstream storytelling. And we don't differentiate in all these like weird segmented ways um, that it's, yeah, we don't have to like, keep I feel like we have to keep claiming our space and and you know we keep getting called pioneers and all of these things and like so I think like hopefully that fight will have ended and we can just have space that exists for us uh, without having to fight for that um, space to exist um yeah that would be my hope for the future I mean hoping that there is a future <laughs> 
climate change. We should advocate for that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that's how I kind of hope that it would be. I think that's like such a simple hope, but maybe we should be thinking bigger, you know, like, you know, huge indigenous gaming uh, conglomerates where we're like, you know, creating hand games that are like rivals with, you know, NBA, um, yeah, you know, like gaming activities or, you know, like we could tell Windigo stories that are, um, sorry, my things going off. We could tell Windigo stories that, you know, are rivaling like, you know, uh, Walking Dead, which is, you know, a big hit on VR right now. So like the challenging that, you know, Indigenous stories can be mainstream stories that people are accessing because they acknowledge the written richness of our storytelling and content creation. Okay, thank you. That is the end of the panel. Um, um, so I just want to say thank you so much again to our partners. Thank you to Kat, uh, Leanne, and Casey for your time and expertise today. Um, and I just want to thank our audience um, and members watching. Um, you, you can see Kat's uh, second major VR piece uh, at the Indigenous Space alongside a ton of new and exciting pieces. Um, so yeah, I just want to say thank you to everyone tuning in um, and have a, a great rest of the festival. Thank you.